Okay, thank you so much for finally make, making time for, for us to have this conversation. Uh, I know there's a lot written about you, so I'll be able to, to do uh, this research on top of what I've already done. But I think it will be fair to say, let me hear it from the horse's mouth. Who is Sonabile? Just Sonabile, is, Sonabile is no more a horse now. He's a donkey. <laughs> that's, that's a nice one. <laughs> anyway, it, it's it's even good because a donkey is mentioned in the Bible, and and I've never seen references to to, 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 to horses. So it's my fine. point exactly. That's why I chose to be a donkey because I become a happy one because I'm a God ride on me. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> and then with, without, without God, then I happen to be a lost donkey either. Because all, <laughs> I, I look like all other donkeys, not special, not, nothing that is being thrown in front yeah. of me. And people singing Hosanna and so forth. Yeah. Because now God is not with me, but when God is with me, and then people start singing Hosanna in the in the highest. It's true. It's true. But anyway, coming to your question, um, I wouldn't know what's the right way um, of describing who Sonwabile is. The only thing that I could say, I am a child of my mom as I will always say, because I grew up under her care and love and uh, wisdom. Um, whilst my dad was still alive, um, and then I was born in the Eastern Cape, in the place called Limode, where actually we are known as the prince and princesses, the Damase clan. Then within that particular space, um, as I grew up, I grew up under a very tight, if I may say so, environment, an environment that was not conducive for some, but I always say, thanks God, I grew up in that kind of an environment, uh, which is the one that brought me to be who I am. It's like when Jesus was born in this in the in the in the stall uh, where you find that it was smelling, it had all those kind of things. And in the meantime, this particular man was brewed to become a man of what he is thereafter. I hope then that does not leave a scenario of, th of thinking that I'm also Jesus on this earth now. I'm only using that as a metaphor. Just wanted to say is most of us, uh, some certain people, we grew up in an environment that are kindly awkward, where you will see a cow releasing and to you that on its own, the mud, you use it for your own feet so that you can be in a position of getting the shelter for your feet as your shoes, because shoes were not part of the things that I grew up having them. So those kind of things, and uh, as well, looking at other people that now my child can wear in other way when he grew up. Some of us, we never wear underwears. We're wearing um, overdressed uh, shirts. Uh, hang out and going to school like that and uh, there's nothing that tells you that uh, there's a taboo in that you were just only wearing it because that's what was available at the time. Um, cutting the long story short, then I grew up in East London. My mom decided to take us in East London and that's where then we had a better life so to speak. And then from that, we had to relate to quite a number of 
what we called um, an urban life because we were from the rural environment. And then I grew up in East London, going to some school and being active in quite a number of other things. And then I ended up finding myself back to Transkai again then. It was Suskai and Transkai. And then when I was back into Transkai, then my next spot was being in another school that was called Lamblau High School. In 1976, I was also very much involved into quite a number of um, projects which were historical for our people, 1976, 1975. And then I was also then ended up not being in part of the guys that were to go to school because we were banned because of the riots then in Eastern Cape. That was the time of Siskai, LL Sebe, and all those other leaders then, CEO and so forth. And then I had to find myself back into Transkai and my mom told me that I need to get away of the town life. It looks like I'm becoming too much involved into politics. And then when I went into Transkai, I went to a school called Lamblau High, which is based in Butterworth. In that particular institution, um, I found myself Funny enough, being as well, being involved in underground kind of movements. And uh, part of that, I uh, found myself being made a bell ringer for the school to keep me so busy. I was a bell ringer, I was a monitor, I was a prefect. I had to play rugby, I had to play soccer, I had to play you know, all those kind of activities and also being in the choir at school. Mm. So that kept me too busy for me to think about politics. I do not know how they got that one true to me. And, uh, but then leadership skills were always there. And then in 1978, I mean, in 1980, 81, then I had to leave my high school. Then I found myself working for a shop called Beggars in Transkai. And uh, when I was working for that shop, it was a clothing company. Uh, I would keep on calling people outside, come inside. There was no job which was bigger because even when I was still at school, I used to be a photographer, uh, taking pictures for people and making myself some extra money, you know. Um, and then I found myself being identified by another group of uh, creative and artistic people who then brought me to Johannesburg. And when I was here in Johannesburg, I started meeting Gibson Kente and all other actors, you know, uh, Yvonne Chaka Chaka, you name it. And all those other artists we used to walk around in Hillbro, in uh, Jobek, Jobek City, and my first time, you know, moving around Jobek, uh, looking at these huge buildings because I was not used to it was part of fun. Uh, I met and I roll around with uh, rolling myself around the quite a number of these um, guys that know um, the, the who's who of Johannesburg. And uh, you can imagine Jill coming to the first time in Johannesburg. Mm. I remember one time when even language was not part of what I was familiar with. And uh, I was then in the street that was called Commissioner Street. Uh, and then I met somebody, I had a Michael Jackson kind of a dressing coat, uh, rolling my sleeves uh, around my arms. And then this uh, particular lady comes to me and said, in that day, kina komang, did you know you are right, you are at Commissioner Street, because I speak, I see what I, I didn't even know that was asking for the time. Said, Kina Komang, you are a right street to the commission. The commission, I don't commission. 
Are you not panicking? Kupanda ako. Yeah. Hmm. So those were some of the nicest uh, the language barriers that I picked up uh, to some other people or so, and um, then I went to study for um, for fashion in another institution based in uh, Bree Street at the time, and. Uh, the funniest thing is that when I found I get into this particular institution, I found that they were not um, passing the knowledge of our African aesthetics. They were not at all closer to that. We were all told about the European designs and so forth. But then I had already been in the industry, in the retail industry, and I've already studied the retail industry because this particular institution I was working for, which was Beggar Store, they were already promoting me to become an assistant manager. But then, because I just saw a pot of gold in Gauteng and in Johannesburg at that time in Transvaal, well, to which we used to be. And then it was to me to say, Ish, you know, staying here in the Eastern Cape whilst there are greener postures on the other side, and like I say, like everyone else, um, it was an, an easy game to be in Johannesburg. And uh, as they say, the rest is the history. Then I found myself uh, on another 10 point where I found myself in the filming industry. Yeah, am I being an actor? Yeah, am I being a model? Yeah, a model clothing? Yeah, I see myself doing quite a number of other things. And then I started to look back. I said, oh, my goodness, the multitasking, I used to do it at school, being a bell ringer, being a monitor, being all those kind of things. Now here am I. I've, I'm finding myself doing so much of the work um, for surviving. And all that I'm doing, I'm doing it in terms of making my mom a happy person. Um then, like they say that the rest is history, but there's so much, but I'll take it from your questions. Okay. Now, I think let's dwell into the fashion brand, Sonabilen Damase. Uh, what does it stand for? What's your brand promise? And how did you establish it from all those different roles that you've been playing? Uh, as a model in film, but then uh, after studying fashion, then you decided to come up with, with this brand. What does it mean? Uh, <clears throat> to me, the brand actually meant so many things. Um, one of the areas that I was pushing was I was doing um, the 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 creative art. I wanted to bring what one will call African aesthetics in the mainstream, because I found that most of our um, designers, especially um, in, 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 in Africa, as well as in the world, we were not at all given the opportunity of us being known out there in the mainstream. And what does that then meant was the fact that me as Sonwabile, having grown up in the rural environment, um, you know, and finding that the African aesthetics were not at all being um, recognized, I had to do something about it. And one of the things that I then um, had to do was to promote um, all the, all what we have as Africans in this particular instant, meaning that Ubuzulu, Ubu Kosa, Ubu Venda, Ushangane, and all these African aesthetics of South Africa, and say, what is the best way 
of putting us in the mainstream, what will be the world later on be happy to see about us? And uh, because being involved in the politics then, I also made it a point that it will be then an opportunity for all South Africans and Africans, if in if ever then I go into the African diaspora, what could be done in those particular platforms? What is it that we could be remembered by the people of the world? And then I said, let me then create a brand that is going to stand out in the world. And guess what happened? And then I started with a word that says Bukani. Vukani means, as you know, wake up. And then I created a brand around Sonabile that is called Fukani, means wake up. And the first thing that I had to do, I had to say, you know what? There are people who have been out there in the mainstream who have also assisted, pardon me, in, in creating uh, beautiful, beautiful brands out there. But how can I then make it a point that this brand, Sonwabile, can also stand up? And then I decided to say, there is a man whom I have been epitomizing. And that man was none other than um, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Then when I thought about it, I said, this man once said he has a dream. And just only to say that he once had a dream, how can I draw a pattern out of him? And I decided to do nothing else, but to do, uh, I mean, to go to, uh, to Atlanta and say, I want to be at this man's um, tombstone and uh, you zap his power and say, before, that was 1994, actually, that was 1993, before 1994, I mean, 1994, before 1990, we received our freedom in South Africa, which is then um, where we had our elections could take place. I went to his tombstone and then I prayed and I lay a wreath in saying, we don't want Americans to start saying, here is new South Africa with the new look of how things are going to be. And then I started to showcase my line in America and I call it Vukani fashions. And I also pay tribute. And then I was given as well by the mayor then, Mel, Mayor Bill Campbell, who was the mayor of Atlanta, proclaiming that 13th of March is Vukani Day on my behalf. And that was one of the awesome and well, well overwhelming things that, my goodness me, here am I in this so-called foreign lane and I'm being given this opportunity to become a man to be reckoned with. So in a, in a nutshell, I then started to say, so Noabile is an in innovator, a creative thinker and a visionary. He is a, a sought after trend analyst and while his feet remain firmly talented, on an African soul. He uses this global perspective to source new ideas and gauge himself into so many other opportunities that resulted to him to become what he is now today. Yeah, you know, for, for me, uh, Vokani Fishings um, speaks to the whole movement of, of Africans uh, tipping into Watungungu, Wationgo, 
uh, described as the decolonization of the mind. And in fact, this is the challenge that we are faced with right now, where we need to find ways of, of uh, Africans approaching life from an Afrocentric perspective where we dispel all the myths around Eurocentrism. So I think it, it is centered there for me and that's why I always love it. But one can talk about Vukani fissions without having in mind uh, Sonavil and Damas. But beyond that, uh, I'm glad you have mentioned Martin Luther King. I didn't know about this aspect. But then for many of us, we know that you can't talk about these two brands without talking about Nelson Mandela. And how, how did you encounter Mandela to an extent that ultimately then you design what has come to be known as the Mandela shirt? Um, very interesting enough, um, I always draw my inspiration from Umama Uwin, Mama Uwini Matikizela Mandela, because that's how I first met Matiba. I met him through Mama Uwin. Um, uh, it, 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 it was in 1990 um, when, I, uh, uh, when uh, I met that uh, after he's released. Um, then also Matiba as, as, as the clan name that is known uh, and I, we are from the same clan, clan which is then in, 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 in the Eastern Cape, which is the Nguno one. And so I use that king, kingship to introduce Matiba to the shirt, which he wanted um, a garment that was user friendly and lightly to wear, but a combination of Europe and Africa. The results was a shirt that was made its mark and uh, on the world, never casual, always buttoned to the top. Classic, as I always call it, well uh, pressed and usually in boldy pattern fabrics that you know of, uh, such as Western African damask wax print and traditional coarser cloth with a bit of braid. Um, the, the, the African print that I use, uh, which is the collection of the Madiba shirt, captures the mystery and pride of Africa and are rich in color and details. They are an original design in limited edition fabrics with true African value. So meeting Matiba at that, at that era was one of those overwhelming opportunity, especially for me, in the sense that when I, meet, uh, when I met Matiba through Mama Winnie, and when he was introduced to me that he wanted to meet me because he wanted something that he can wear, as I've explained those kind of stylish shirts that he was wearing, which made him uh, to stand out within the majority in the world. But it, uh, one of the things that people do not understand is that those shirts, um, when I designed them, were not for anything one would call it fashionable item. Those were for him for health purpose. You will understand that when Madiba actually was released, he was already in frail, so to speak. He was not in good condition. Um, so his health was kind of not well because by the time that they released him, it was the time that uh, he was already in his 70s or 80s, so to speak, yes. And therefore, whilst he was still in jail, 
He then explained to me, whilst he was still in Robben Island and when he was moved into Pozo and all those other prison places, he had already a, a lung infection. So within that, he couldn't breathe proper. So whatever that he was wearing, it was kind of giving him a lot of heat. So he asked me to design and come up with the clothing and something that could be lighter, but still be conservative whenever then he gets in meeting the people in the trade and the people, um, the, the ordinary people. It must not be something that when he dresses up could be something that intimidate the public. So, so then when I started to come up with this kind of printed fabric as I've explained them to him, it was an overwhelming opportunity. But funny enough, uh, contrary, uh, Mama Wini was one of those people who teased me immediately when I was bringing those kind of shirts with the damask work, sprint and so forth. And then he started to say to me, how, so no, I mean, why are you dressing my husband with cotton fabric? Then I started. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, she was a fashion icon also. She was yeah. a fashion icon on her own. Yeah. But now, the, the, the very funniest thing is that how she just, and funny, if you look at the, the, that kind of a teaser she was saying, and most people, when they started to see this fabric, they started to make others cotton because they are floral. Anything that was floral was used as cotton in our African community, you know? And, uh, but let me also say that when then Mama was also in that particular meeting, when I was starting to tell Utata and we were discussing about that and Mama was very much in front of telling to say, you know what, whatever that you will be doing, uh, do something that will be comfortable for my husband while they were still together at the time before Mama Krasha came into the picture. So that's how then the Madiba sheds came into being. It was a look that was needed for them and especially for him to work for his health. But guess what happened? It became a fashion iconic statement for him and other people started to look at it and believe that Madiba was a fashion icon but not wearing these for any particular thing except for fashion statement. And he was the only one who deviated from the Westminster tradition when he was meeting Queen Elizabeth and came wearing your shirt. How did Indeed. you feel, you know, and each time when you are looking at that picture, what images come, come into your mind and yeah, what feelings, you know, run through your body when you see that picture? Uh, you know, you know what, one of the things that keeps on coming and uh, uh, feeling that I have, it's, 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 it's an overwhelming feeling, uh, like a child getting into a candy shop store, uh, seeing all the beauty around of the street, you do not know which one to take, and you ended up galloping everything at the first time. That was the feeling that I had. And fortunately for, for your information is that I was also invited as part of the entourage when he was meeting the queen for the first time. I was one of his entourage. Even when he was at the Dorchester Minister Hotel, I was there invited in that particular. Wow. I still have my table 
when we were in that particular, even when he was giving the speech for the first time, mm -hmm. reciprocating mm -hmm. to the queen when the queen came in, I was there in that hall. In that hall. So mm -hmm. to me, all those things were actually after, at the time that was happening, I was just having that feeling that says, this is the place to die for. You know that feel, that says, that says, I will die for this. And I said to myself, when I was in that particular hotel with the queen, with him, with the Duke of Edinburgh, with all these other statesmen, even actually the current um, uh, president, Sir Ramaphosa, was in that particular um, hotel at that time. We're all hosted. I even have got a picture that I took with him when then we were outside uh, after, the, uh, after the lunch that was served. Now, it was one of those moments that I said, my goodness me, if I die here, my family will be rich. <laughs> you know, that typical thing. We'll be saying we were killed in this particular room with all these people. So those are kind of things that came running. Now at a later stage, when I keep on seeing him uh, and with the shirt, and that is the shirt that I've designed, that's a concept that I came up with, and I cannot even stop, you know, feeling that um, in the darkest dungeon of Liborde, there is this man who have dressed the presidents of the democratic new dispensation of our African continent. And this time around South Africa. And this man is the one that I gave you the story with from the rural environment and from a woman who never knew what he was looking after and he was helping a new president that was going to be a democratic of this country will be dressed by his son. So that is one of the things that keep on running into my head. In fact, yeah, I think, let me ask you this question. When you were saying to your mom, that you wanted to be a fashion designer. What was her reaction? Because I, I know um, with our generation, they always expected us to be teachers or nurses or police officers. And when you were saying, I want to be a fashion designer, this was a very foreign career in African communities because we only knew about those mamas who, who were dressmakers. All right. But, but they never saw themselves as, as fashion designers. Now, now, here's this guy who says he wants to be a fashion designer. What was your mom's immediate reaction to that? Funny enough, my mom actually was a versatile, talented person. My craft, I've learned it from her because she used to mend our pants and mend our shirts and so forth and so forth from the house. I used to assist her and I used to help in the house shows. I knew how to cook. So to, to come up with the word fashion designer, it's a foreign and a late thing that come into the being. The first thing that comes into being is just a tailor. Being a tailor and then a dressmaker as well, and then a seamstress, those are the words that were utilized in that era. In so much that my, my friends, I remember vividly clear that they used to call me and think that I am 
going to be so called, they will say you are a sissy. If you are doing the inside, the, 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 the family shows as a man, you know, they will say, oh, that one is going to be a sissy, you know, and all those kind of things. And, and funny enough, at school, I should think my mind was, I augmented it by playing rugby and soccer. That is where so I was bringing the masculinity element. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Indeed, I should think I was bringing in the masculinity in me. And so much that I break one time my arm when I was playing rugby in my other school at Chokoma in Tanzania, just because I was proving that hey, listen, guys, this is a man. I'm not a sis. <laughs> Yeah. But, then, but then, funny enough, at a later stage, when I started, even at school, I was Mr. Butterworth, you know, you know, I was getting involved into competition, running and all these things. I thought that this thing was following me on the other end to say, mm-hmm. hey, when, <laughs> this yeah, is your yeah. path. <laughs> so when I told my mom, and then I told her at a later stage that, Mama, I have decided to get into the fashion industry. And Mama says, oh, my gosh, here I am. I'm not going to get any money here from this man. Because all what I was saying is an entrepreneurship of me being in the fashion designing and so forth. He, she never thought that there's going to be money. In so much that, in Transkai then, um, our late um, um, president, Chuta Ndamase, if you have heard of him, Chuta Ndamase, uh, he was the state president of Transkai during the homeland. Mm-hmm. Now, every time when I have to visit the palace in Transkai, he will ask and say to my dad, what is this man is who's this man is always around women and he keeps on touching the uh, the figures of our women what is he doing with that <laughs> because it was also strange to him finding men carrying a tape measure being measuring you know women and all that, because they were asking my aunt and my uncle were asking clothes from me at that, at that age. So it was still still foreign to my elderly, foreign to my mom, but at the end of the day, um, I never got what I will call a huge support to my family, because mm. one of the things that they believed, it was a foreign thing, even Mama Winnie Mandela, actually, at the time when I approached her uh, in the 80s, started, he never, she never took it very keen to assist me as a fashion designer and a man. Nohari, he was saying, and you're coming from Transkai. How do you break the barriers of a masculinity of a man? And then he just mm-hmm. thought that I might um, uh, be involved in 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 in, 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 in sense of political uh in PMP to come and infiltrate her space by being into the Mandela family because at the time it was such a taboo to be with the Mandelas and it mm. was a, such a, a a thing that no one else was, would have loved to be closer to them. Of uh, within that particular family at the time. Um, we are now looking at the opportunities. Later on, we will look at the the challenges you you faced along the way. Um, uh, you 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 did a post on Facebook a while back about the costumes that you did for a television production. Um, And then you also went into the traditional aesthetics, uh, talking about Amampondo different from 
the normal Tosa tradition. Uh, can you tell us about that? Because I found it very, very fascinating. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> at a particular time, I, I, like I told you that I've been also involved in the filming industry. Uh, whilst I have been involved in the filming industry as an actor, um, I was also involved in the wardrobe design and selection of the clothes for different characters that have to be played in that. Now, funny enough, um, there is this particular producer um, who then said, because he said, Contrary, me as Sonobi Lenda must have never been celebrated enough uh, for what I've done in this particular country of ours and also in the African diaspora. And then he felt to say, you know what? There is this production that he's doing. Um, and then he has got a section that um, he would like to see me featuring on, and that section will be Amampondo. And he kept on asking me, what is the difference between Amampondo and all other ethnic groups? And then I started to explain that to him and our culture, how it is, because we come from the royal family. And then he says, okay, fine. Let's see how we can develop a dialogue in that particular space. And how do these people dress up? And can I take, because there are quite a number of traditions that you will see this, case, this, this time around, you will see the, the Corsas, how they dress up. You will see the Zulus, they've seen their weddings. How can I take a wedding of an Amambondo to the highest level in a today's world so that even a child who's born of Ubumbondo will not be afraid to embrace Ubumbondo back, her own Ubumbondo? Then what can I do? And that I said, no, it's fine. I will be in a position, then I started to craft and come up with a beautiful garment for a wedding of two cultures that is Amazon and in who are marrying a pond of woman, which is the princess. So that's already that um, I had to create that, <clears throat> pardon me, in that particular space in showcasing that we as Amambondo, we do have a culture and our culture, as much as it is dormant, but it is a beautiful culture. And even our language, therefore, I started to display from that perspective. Um, what are the challenges you met along the way? Because if especially young fashion designers look at you, they'll think it was just very easy for you to just be right there at the top. Uh, what are the pitfalls that they could look out for? There is much of quite a number of challenges that one meets if a person is not focused in whatever that he or she is doing. Therefore, chances for any particular person to succeed are very slim. That's one. You need as a designer to be focused into your craft. Don't do anything whatsoever that you are doing and uh, rushing for fame, rushing for recognition, rushing to, for popularity, rushing for the media to catch up with you and so forth. First, polish your craft. Check what is it that, whether 
this craft that you have taken is the best of it all. The, then the next thing that is happening is that there is quite a number of potfalls along the road. If you are taking our craft just only for the fame and glitz and glamour, at a particular time, you are going to fall because you will be hurt because you are not getting what you thought this is going to give it to you. If you are taking your craft and knowing that this craft that you are busy with, this is the craft that is going to help and feed you. This is, you are becoming an entrepreneur. You want to pay rent. You want to educate yourself. You want to educate your family and you want to become a person, a business person within your craft. And therefore, you are at the right place. But many a times that are picked up from these young and upcoming designers and um, why then they will keep on asking me that how do I make it? And I still, even others, they keep on asking me that I made, I was still in existence in the time of Mandela. They thought that after Mandela, because I was known as a Mandela man, as in terms of my dressing code, then I will disappear. When Mandela actually is no more the president, but guess what? In the era of, as well, Tabombeki, I was still existing. And then in the era of uh, Zuma, I was still existing. Now is the era of Cyril Ramaphosa, and I'm still existing, you know? And, and I'm saying to them, I am not aligning myself. My brand is not a political brand. My brand, it is a brand that showcases that Africans need to be themselves in the space. Come whatever that happens around you, do not be drawn by the hype and the glitz of what is happening. And now for them that most of the time I see them failing is that they rush because they are all looking for this particular gleam and glitz. And when then the lights are off, they can't exist. They do not know in dark times, there is also a silver lining that you need to look for because there's still gonna be another day tomorrow. So that's one of the things that I keep on telling them that this is not a trade that you get involved with for just only fun. It is a trade that you have to get into it because you want to become a business person and there is a purpose. And most of the time, I always say, I'm doing the job of God. When God created Adam and Eve, when he saw them that they were naked, the first thing that he did. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so my life is next to God, not even to Jesus. It is next yeah. to God to clothe people when I see them naked. So it is our duty to come up with the garment all the time and clothe our people. Yes, fashion is your pastoral work. <laughs> okay, um, this takes us into you training uh, many young designers. Tell us about your training program. Uh, one of the, uh, anybody that has worked with um, or has been closer to Nelson Mandela will always have a scenario of saying, Madiba in essence, he always loved um, very much the youth. He loved children. That's why he came up with the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Nelson Mandela Children's Fund. Uh, then the Mandela's way of leaving his legacy, he made it a point that young people must be looked after. He made it a point that every time you are doing anything that you are doing, 
you must make the point that you are there for the new generation. Mine then that he left me with is that I've touched him, I've trusted him. What can I do for the young people so that they can still feel him even if ever he cannot meet with them? And then I said, I would love to leave them with a training, meaning that whenever I speak to them, whenever I train them, I'm leaving them with the legacy of the Matiba Shed. I'm leaving them with the legacy. When they touch me, when they have pictures with me, at the end of the day, I'm transferring the skills. I'm giving them the hope to say the there is a silver lining in this dark cloud, in the poverty that you are in. So my training is also accredited by the FPNM CETA in the sense that because all what I'm trying to do is to make it a point that these learners cannot uh, lose hope. It's not a training that at the end of the day, after training them, they will not at all elevate them. It's an accredited one. They can get into the next level from the uh, level one to get to level two, level two, level three, and they can utilize the certificates or they can utilize their um, diplomas, whatever that they have received under us to look for a job. One of the things that I do as well to assist them, you will get that I said to you in the beginning that uh, we once had a challenge. I had a challenge of going to school without a uniform. Now I'm linking them to the Department of Social Services so that at the end of the day, they can start making a living out of what they are doing. E clothing, it's not about the clean and clads and all those kind of things. If ever, then you can even do the school uniform. There is money there. The survival uh, exchange rate that you can get out of that. Those are some of the things that I've started and I've, I'm using them. So our training is not just on a training. It's for the training. And also we give mentorship for those that leave the institution of learning for higher education that in, wants to get practicals, we open our studio for them so that everybody, they can also achieve whatever that their institution would have given to them as in terms of their diploma. So I always create, I've got also now this year, we were given about 60 learners to look after. From those 60 learners, we included as well internship for those particular learners who don't see or the industry has shrink for them to have practicals. Now I've created a space for them so that they can have their practicals in my own space so that at a later stage, they can go and attain their diplomas and be in a position of becoming independent entrepreneurs. I don't take them as what others will say as competitors. I can't teach them because they will do the same thing. Hey, if you know the sip of your brand, no one else, but if ever people start to duplicate you whilst you're still alive, the better. Because so many people have copied the Madiba shirt, they've called it in all other names, just only to get the slice in the marketplace. That doesn't shook me at all. Instead, it makes me happy. I did something and other people are duplicating it. If they do it better, let them do it. If they do it lesser, let them. If they can make money out of it, let them. Because all is about the survival for us to live in this planet where we are at. But at the end of the day, all what we are doing is passing. And tomorrow, it's history. Then tell me about your partnership with the Nelson Mandela Foundation and also a number of retail outlets uh, that made your, your products more accessible to many people. I have quite a number of um, mandatory uh, 
opportunities that actually have come through. We have actually the Nelson Mandela Museum, which also actually we assist them in terms of their educational part uh, in Amtata as part of what we call plowback uh, projects. And then also we have got an, um, another opportunity that we have done or we still most of the time do with the Nelson Mandela Foundation as in terms of also on the side of education as with the young and upcoming fashion designers and also expanding this particular product that we have, which is the product of manufacturing. Oh, sorry, we have also other uh, uh, opportunities that we do have uh, in the mainstream. Um, one with, um, like I was saying to you, FPNM CETA, which is fiber processing and manufacturing CETA, as in terms of accreditation, and also they help and uh, assist us um, when then. Um, the opportunities avail, and also one of the things that they are good at, the FPNM CETA, um, is the legacy of Madiba. They are saying to me, I must leave this legacy of creativity to the young and upcoming. So every time they give me the learners that I could be training, which at the end of the day, they will give them the stipend. Um, so so, so these are the, those are the, um, um, uh, the opportunities that then start to avail themselves in, in, in whatever that we are doing. So what, what we do here in this particular institution of um, Vukani Fashions is to market and expose some of the young and upcoming uh, products. That is why then I always teach them on what we call originality and saying copycatting does not take you anywhere. But if you are doing something that you are passionate and passionate about it, it's the first step towards your success of how you can um, make your brand becomes more and more visible out there because you are not a copycat for anyone, you know? And then you can start learning at a later stage to commercialize whatever that you are doing, but never lose the roots of where you're coming from. This year you conquered uh, Milan Fashion Week and Paris Fashion Week. Tell us about this experience because those are the fashion capitals of the world. And there you were flying, not just South African flag, but the African flag. I must say that, uh, you know, if you are doing, you are being original in essence, in anything that you are doing, the world will always see through you and want to know what's the best way to take you into the right places. Um, there is a lady who runs a huge fashion show in Milan by the name of Natalia um, with the company or institution that is called um, Fashion Week International. What then happened is that um, with my creative juice that I've been having, and then she asked a very nice, simplest question that everybody and people like yourself as well always ask about the beautiful fabrics that I'm using as in terms of my African aesthetics. Why then I am not always the person who's in the forefront. I always do things in the backyard. I said, Madiba once taught me one thing, says most of the time you must lead from the back, not from the front. And then you will see the fruits from those that you are leading, if ever then they are 
doing the best out of what you have taught them to do. So by going to Milan, my Milan Fashion Week was my first of its kind. And then I, I mesmerized inside myself to find out what could be the best way of representing my Africanness, my continent in a European platform. Uh, I thought about it. And then my first thing that came into mind was this old lady who is no more, which is Mama Winnie Matikisela Mandela. And then I said, she has been an icon and she embraced my signature of Africanness in wearing Isimpondo and in wearing Isikos. What could be the best way of busting and creating these um, white superiors in, in, in that particular platform and prickle their eye to see that Africa has arrived. Because I cannot go and fight them with their guns. I needed my own Nobkiri to take it with. And then I said, my only shield and Nobkiri will be my Africanness that I could bring to them. And then I showcase them and utilizing my beautiful Isimpondo and Isikosa as an opening and as a closing high couture uh, 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 line I could show them. And then also I took the, 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 the Matiba shirts as what I have been known with and but use the other side of that and use only now for female uh, dress code, which is called kiminos. I then decided to use the kimono and use with the fabric of Madiba. And then I gave the world the taste of the pudding that if they've never ever thought of. And I showed them that collection and it was a wow, the woo their unforgettable story for them. And I did it and I was happy. I was so excited when I saw you on, on social media because Milan used to be my, my playground when I was there on diplomatic posting. And the reason why I was so excited is because I, I I knew that it's quite difficult for anyone, especially from Africa, to break into that circle. And yes, I, I was so excited. Then I said, yes, finally one of us has made it. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, and, and it's worth celebrating, not only by, by South Africa, but the entire continent. This should take us into your dream for the continent because we are now talking about integrating Africa into one common uh, free trade area uh, through the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. We are, we are breaking all these barriers so that we could be able to boost intra-African trade. Uh, what's your your dream for, for the continent and for your brand um, making inroads across the entire continent? Uh, fortunately enough, I have mentored some young guns from our African continent through a brand that I used to carry up, which was called um, Red. RAFTA, Red African Designers Awards. Um, it took that product for five years where I was traveling in many about 10 of our African continent and looking and mentoring the young guns, young designers. I had a competition that I was doing in Ghana, I had a competition that was Tanzania and so forth and Mozambique, so forth and so forth. So I have made some inroads in those particular places and they have, it's, it's, it's amazing 
how much of the red carpet that was rolled for me when I went into those particular places. I like home. When I'm here at home, it's a funniest uh, phenomenon of one, because you are not the so-called, they are celebrities, so they call it, I do not know how they put celebrity, how they put whatever, if ever then you're not in their circle of uh, people in their VVIP, they, you always get into those uh, invites of theirs. I don't go to quite a number of those things because at the end of the day, they don't even put my brand to where I want it to be. But to answer your question into that, I have done a lot of um, um, uh, scenario in checking the, the brand uh, for international market. And I have people that were very much interested, which are, they're still interested, who are buying my some of my brand and they place it into their international um, stores, uh, so to pe speak. And um, we have done quite a number of work for international market. We have done a number of work as well for our own local market. And that is why then I am still very much grounded to be where I am at at the moment. And now already the international market is starting. I started to water their appetite. They are already wanting to find out how they can have a piece of my pie in their in their platform. Even now in New York, I was just invited now by other guests that were there. They wanted me to come and uh, display my product in, 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 in their New York. Uh, although I've been involved in the New York Fashion Week as well. And funny enough, when I was in Paris some years ago, I was invited by Daniel Hachter and, uh, you know, to come in and uh, be part of his entourage. Um, in, in, in essence, in whatever that he was doing then. And I've got pictures as well with Daniel Hachta. And uh, unfortunately, Lafayette was not available at the time, but his people were in a position of looking after me. So Europe and uh, Africa as my continent, we have been very much in, in, in Lesotho, you name it. Actually, when King Litsia, was also marrying, uh, I mean, his first wife, I was dressing them. So I am into those particular platforms most of the time in their worlds, whatever it is. And uh, so that's the beauty of what I've done uh, around the international and my African neighboring countries. Yeah, yes, for me, my interest in you is that what sets, sets you apart from everybody else across the continent is that um, you communicate uh, African aesthetics and they are, the African idiom is right there, you know, uh, in the DNA of your, of your, of your brand. Uh, as you know, uh, my, my new book is this one titled uh, Brand Africa. Uh, deconstructing brand Africa, a practitioner's perspective. And I would mm -hmm. say that, in fact, um, beyond this, we need to talk about yeah, taking that initiative, perhaps resources allowing, uh, starting with regional economic capitals, South Africa for Southern Africa, Kenya for East Africa. Uh, Correct. Yeah, Nigeria for West Africa, maybe even Central African Republic for, for the economic community of Central African states, and maybe even Egypt for, for, for North Africa, where then, yeah, we also integrate Africa through, through, through fashion. Uh, I've just started a, a, a new just show on, on High FM, and even though we are looking at just internationally, um, our 98% of all the 
songs that I play are largely uh, just from African countries. Um, for now, especially South, South Africa. Now, I'm looking at you from a branding perspective because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a branding specialist. I look at you as house of brands. Um, you are not like Armani. You know, uh, Armani has adopted this monolithic uh, branding approach where everything starts with we with Armani, you know, um, you have uh, Armani collections, you have Giorgio Armani, you have uh, Armani Fiori, like uh, uh, Armani flowers, you have uh, Armani collection. But with you, I'm looking at you like when we started, you have Vukani Fashion, which is a brand in itself. You have Sonabil and Damas, who is a brand, by, by the way. Then you have Madiba Shet. So I'm just looking at you as house of brand. And I think along the way, um, you also need to, to have various connections under these three brands. Even though there's also training and, you know, there is also that Pan-African approach, but but I think ultimately then you may even say some of these sub-brands, they serve a particular market segment or a group of a, a number of, of market segments. Uh, just like, you know, you have Armani and then uh, Armani Collection, you have uh, Juju Armani, they, they, they are all targeted to various uh, market segments. I think this is what you could be looking at uh, going forward. Um, your, your take on that, because my worry is that we also need to, to derive maximum benefit even out, out of the Sonaville and Damase brand, which is a brand that you are not uh, maximizing right now. It, it is, it is uh, I must say so that whatever that you have said, it's, um, you know, you, people like yourselves, you know what I'm trying to say, who have been given, you know, I'm a creative person. That's what I am. Uh, I'm a visionary. That's what I am. But I need to most of the time I became too comfortable in what I do. And whilst people like yourselves, that sees is beyond than what I'm doing. And therefore I need to have those kind of network. So people like yourself, I, I would like us to take this conversation to the next level and see then what's the best way of starting it because you have already have what you have created, what you have put out there as a book, as a reference. How do I then draw my inspiration from what you have already done as a reference? I am not into that kind of a space, but having a relationship and a cooperative and um, with people like yourself, I should think we can do that. It can happen, and um, maybe it was it was good away uh, awaiting that the COVID must come and go, and now we are left with another COVID, which is called load shedding, and it will come and go. Maybe then we'll use a candle and write under the candle light in terms of these kind of ideas before. Um, we, some of us, we disappear in the mainstream, but we're happy that we are still making those kind of inroads at our age. And now with people like yourselves who like to align us in the right direction. I am so thankful that this moment has come to what it has become. And uh, I'm happy that maybe then we could even start with all what you are saying, this kind of branding, and then you start creating something 
for the new generation, which they can learn from and how to maintain these kind of brands. But even if ever we do it in our cultural way, but you will tweak it, have that international flavor into it. So I leave it unto you. No, thank you so much, Maji, for this opportunity. Yes, um, this conversation uh, will be carried on all our platforms, um, your YouTube, uh, but particularly the, the text version and, and the video itself will be in Jumbo. It will be in Jumbo Africa online from this Friday. And yes, um, in the next few days, uh, we will catch up for, for coffee and we start dreaming about how do we tap into all these opportunities uh, that the operationalization of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, is, is, is opening them up for, for all of us, particularly uh, South Africa uh, being the most sophisticated economy and the third biggest uh, economy on the continent. Uh, Brand South Africa is still quite very big, but we need now to look at brand Africa as a whole to say, how, how do we take it across the world? And yeah, you are the, the best person who could anchor uh, such an initiative uh, to change perceptions on Africa across the entire continent. No, thank you so up. much. Yeah. My hand is up. Don't forget. Okay, thank you. Thank <laughs> you so much, my chief. No, definitely we, we will move. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, sir. Yeah.